afternoon, everybody. So my name is uh, Robert Moffitt. I uh, am a uh, former uh, grad student and postdoc and from the physics department and also a uh, former uh, president of the Stanford Amateur Radio Club. And uh, I'm currently working full-time on a startup company, but I'm still up in the area and, and I'd like to volunteer to help out the club. So, uh, so that's an introduction to myself. And uh, KG4UHM is my amateur radio call sign. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So, uh, so let me just start with an overview of this activity and what we're going to be doing. So this is a rough schedule of uh, what we're planning to do. And uh, we'll, th this is flexible though, so we'll modify it as we go along. I uh, have scheduled four weeks currently for working on the, uh, the QDX kit. And that was just a rough estimate of how long I thought it would take. But if, uh, if we have uh, people who need a bit more time, or if you're a beginner to electronics and uh, you're going a little bit more slowly, uh, the lab director here has said that we're able to extend the amount of time that we reserve and we can add a few uh, more weeks at the end. So uh, we'll make sure that everybody's able to uh, complete their kit. And so, uh, so I've scheduled about four weeks for doing the uh, QDX kit, and then once your kit is ready, you'll need an antenna. So we have a few different options. There's a simple dipole option I'll talk about later, and we have some materials for that. Uh, there's some more um, uh, uh, more high performance antennas that have extra features that you could uh, build if you want, and uh, we'll we'll talk a bit about those. And if people are interested, there's even a few uh, antenna kits that we could order uh, that could complement the uh, QDX kit nicely. But uh, just a simple wire antenna should be enough to get you started. Also, uh, Professor John Pauly is going to be teaching an amateur radio license class. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but. We'll plan to have that going on concurrently with the uh, QDX kit building. It'll be taking place during the week. Uh, William was running a uh, poll on our uh, club Slack channel uh, to see what day works best for everybody. I think pe most people wanted Monday, 7 yeah. p.m., is that right? So, uh, so we'll check with John Pauly, make sure that that's a good day for him as well. But we're currently scheduling that to be happening on Mondays, 7 p.m. for one hour. And it'll be uh, six weeks. And it's an informal class. You don't need to register for it any or anything. Just show up. and. Uh, We'll just review some of the information you need to know to uh, pass your uh, license test. Uh, yes. Is it possible to join on Zoom? Uh, oh, I'll check with him and see if he plans to do that. Yeah. Uh, yes. If we can't make 7 p.m. Mondays, is there another option? Um, yeah, I guess we'll see if there's the Zoom option. We might report them. Uh, he he posts his lecture slides on uh, online, so you can also review the lecture slides uh, on your own, and. Uh, We'll see if there's any other options besides those. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes? Are there going to be further communications about this QDX uh, in the, either the antennas or the kit construction or the license classes over Slack? Uh, and if there are, uh -huh. how do people get who are not on Slack? Get oh, yeah. on so uh, I think everybody who replied to me, you should be on the club mailing list. Do you get the emails that I send? Uh, is there anybody who's not received an email from me? Okay, so yeah, so if you're all on the mailing list, then uh, usually on every uh, message I send to the mailing list, on the bottom there's a link that says Slack. So if you click that link, uh, that, that should allow them to join the Slack, yeah. right? So uh, make sure that you, you join the Slack channel as well. I try to post in both places on the mailing list and Slack, but there's more information on Slack. So uh, people have, have conversations about plans or things that they're building, also other activities that are happening in the club. So make sure that you join the Slack channel as well. Uh, good, good point, thanks. Uh, and uh, also regarding other club activities, I added that there. There's uh, tons of other stuff going on in the club, a lot of people working on different projects. And uh, so there, there's, uh, we have a lot of people who have been uh, have long experience with the club. And uh, they volunteered to come help out, guide people building the circuits today. But feel free to ask them about other things that are going on in the club, other uh, projects and things like that. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that you can participate in as well. So that's the uh, all right. So that's the overview. Any questions before we move on? No. Okay. So let me uh, for the people who are new, let me just give a quick overview of what amateur radio is. So uh, amateur radio is also known by the term uh, ham radio, and it's. Uh, it consists of certain frequencies that are set aside for public use, uh, and specifically for uh, non-commercial use. So commercial uh, applications would be things like cell phone frequencies, television broadcasts, uh, things like that. Anything that's amateur radio is purely non-commercial. And, uh, 
And you do need a uh, license to transmit on these frequencies. Uh, uh, unlike other bands like uh, Citizens Band Radio, uh, where you don't need license, but it's uh, a lot more powerful what you're able to do with it once you have that license. Uh, that's part of the reason why you need a license, because you can cause a lot more interference to people if you're not uh, using your radio properly. And, uh, and so the uh, people use amateur radio for um, a variety of different things, just uh, general communications or recreation. Uh, you can use it uh, to uh, uh, just talk to people in places where you don't have very good uh, cell phone coverage or, or other uh, forms of communication. Uh, people use it uh, for experimentation. There's a lot of people in our club who do things like build their own radio equipment and test it out, and uh, having this license allows you to broadcast very high amounts of power into the, uh, into the radio spectrum. And uh, people also do uh, competitive contesting. So uh, even if you aren't interested in building your own radios, if you just want to use a radio and try to make contacts with a lot of people all over the world, and people uh, compete during these uh, usually 24-hour periods to make as many contacts as, as they can in some set geographical area. And uh, there's a lot of different forms that that takes. So that's, there are a lot of people in the club who are very uh, active in that, too. And finally, there's also emergency communications. So if normal communications infrastructure goes down, then ham radio is an excellent backup to that. And you can communicate over uh, from tens of miles to thousands of miles to all over the world, depending on the, uh, the part of the radio spectrum that you're using. And it's a uh, great way to have some sort of a backup in case of emergency, if there happens to be an earthquake or, uh, or a hurricane or something like that, and there's a wide power outage, cell phone isn't working, um, you can uh, help to coordinate communications over amateur radio and keep in touch with people. So, uh, so I mentioned, oh, what was that? Yeah. No, I said in soda. Oh, oh yeah, soda. So there's uh, something called summits on the air. So people like to bring radios up onto mountaintops too, to try to make contacts uh, from mountaintop to mountaintop, or from mountaintop to uh, other locations. So, uh, so I mentioned before you need a, a license to transmit. You do not need a license to listen. So anyone can listen to these frequencies. Uh, but if you want to transmit, you need to be uh, licensed. And the license is uh, not that difficult to get, but you do need to study for it. So it's a, uh, it's a multiple choice exam. And you only have to pass 74% in, uh, in order to get your license. And there's three different levels of the license. So there's the, uh, the beginning level, which is technician. Uh, then there's a more advanced level called general. And then the, the highest level is called extra. And as you pass each of these levels, you get more and more frequencies that you're allowed to use. So the technician starts out with the uh, lowest number of frequencies. And then you can grow it from there. So uh, there's question pools available online. So this multiple choice test that you'll get uh, they'll choose uh, 35 questions out of a set of a few hundred uh, questions, and those questions are public. So everybody gets to see those questions and the answers. So if you want, you can just go through all those questions and memorize them. Uh, and then whatever 35 you get, you'll, as long as you remember them, you'll know. Uh, and, um, but the, probably the better way to practice is they have practice exams where they have a, if you go to this website here, it'll uh, automatically generate a random test using 35 questions from that known pool, and then you'll be able to uh, uh, you know, practice just as if you were taking your test and try answering them. And uh, the ones you get wrong, it'll tell you what the correct answer is and why. Uh, but those are things that Professor uh, John Pauly will be talking about in his uh, license class, too. So uh, like I mentioned, we'll probably be doing that uh, Monday nights uh, at 7 p.m. for one hour for uh, six weeks. So these are the uh, frequencies here that you're allowed to use once you get your amateur radio license. And they actually um, span a very wide range of frequencies and wavelengths. And so the, uh, uh, and if you look at the uh, frequencies though, each of these spans of frequencies, um, if you were to compare it to the total span of frequencies, it's just a very narrow uh, sliver. So in this very wide range of spectrum, which is uh, administered by the Federal Communications Commission in the US or the FCC, uh, they've uh, carved out these little narrow slivers uh, throughout the radio spectrum and set that aside just for public use through amateur radio. And, uh, and so these uh, letters here tell you uh, which of these you're allowed to use with the different license classes, like ex this is extra, uh, this is general, uh, T's technician here. So, uh, so the technician license, it starts out giving you access to all of these uh, higher frequencies. 
And most of these uh, lower frequencies, you need the general or extra in order to use, except for some small bits of the spectrum, like a technician allows you to use these, the small span of frequencies here. And uh, there's, uh, uh, these frequencies come within certain uh, wide ranges of frequencies that have uh, names. So you see here that says low frequency, medium frequency, high frequency. Uh, th these names were actually uh, chosen many years ago when this was considered to be a high frequency. This has got three uh, megahertz. So, of course, as technology has improved, people have made transistors and other devices operate at higher and higher frequencies. And as a result, people have had to come up with uh, more and more uh, superlative terms to describe how high the frequency is. They have very high frequency, ultra high frequency, super high frequency, extremely high frequency. I think there's one past that called, called tremendously high frequency. <laughs> so, uh, but the, uh, these ranges of frequencies are pretty easy to remember. They're all just uh, a decade of frequencies. So low frequency is 30 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz. The next decade is medium frequency. Uh, uh, the one above that is high frequency, 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz. Then there's VHF, 30 to 300 megahertz, UHF, 300 to 3 gigahertz, and then uh, so on. So, uh, so, these, uh, so these frequencies uh, have a lot of different uh, properties. So the, based on the uh, frequency, uh, the frequency is related to the wavelength. So is everybody familiar how frequency and wavelength are related? Can anyone tell me what the formula is to relate? Frequency to wavelength? Raise, raise your hand if you know what that is. Yes, in the back. One over C. So, yeah, they're related by C, the speed of light. So, the, uh, so if you know uh, frequency, then what is the wavelength for that frequency? It's, uh, the frequency. it's P over the frequency. Yes, so uh, the speed of light divided by the frequency is your wavelength. So these wavelengths here, so this spans like the lowest one here, it says it's 80 meters. The highest one is 10 meters. So that's coming from this span of frequencies. Um, then the next one, this goes from uh, 6 meters up to uh, 1.25 meters, and so on. This one's 70 centimeters. So these, uh, so these frequencies, based on the wavelength, have different properties, and they behave differently. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. But uh, in the Stanford Amateur Radio Club, uh, we actually use all of these. So, so we're a uh, student organization. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of people from uh, either alumni, people from the Stanford community who have uh, long experience in uh, radio and electronics and, are, and work with uh, students to do all sorts of very uh, creative and interesting projects. So we have people who work at these uh, you know, super high frequencies and extremely high, fr high frequency millimeter wave, microwave uh, dish um, uh, projects like this. We have some of these uh, Antennas here, which operate in the high frequency or HF part of the uh, spectrum. Uh, we have uh, things in the VHF here. Uh, in this picture, we're actually communicating with some uh, satellites. And uh, this one here is a dish that operates at 10 gigahertz, which uh, is being used to bounce the signal off of the moon. So people do all sorts of things uh, in our club. So we have uh, we go up on these mountaintop expeditions with uh, antennas. We do uh, uh, antenna builds. We do uh, bounce signals off of the moon. We uh, try operating mountain top, top to mountain top with microwaves. There's a huge range of things that people do in the club. So like I said, make sure you talk to people about what other activities are going on because uh, there's probably a lot of other things you might be interested in. And our club has been uh, around for a very long time. So it was uh, uh, rumored to have been founded in 1922 at Stanford. And uh, one of the original members was actually uh, Hewlett from Hewlett and Packard. So the history goes way back. And so here, here's some photos I got from uh, part, part of our website that show the history of the club throughout the, uh, the last century. And uh, so this picture here is the earliest one I found, which was from 1930. And uh, people have been continually experimenting with radio and uh, pushing the limits of what you can do with radio for, in our club for you know over 100 years now. And. Uh, uh, our club has some very nice uh, facilities available to, to you as well. So we have a, a very large station up in the foothills. If you've ever hiked the Dish Trail, there's a little uh, uh, road that goes off the, uh, the main uh, hiking trail here. And if you continue down that road, then you get to what we call the shack, which is actually a building that looks like this. And it's surrounded by all sorts of very impressive antennas. Uh, some of them were recently damaged by wind, so they, they need to be repaired. But there's still a lot of uh, great antennas up there. 
and, uh, and a lot of uh, dishes and things like that. It's a very impressive facility. So we may be able to uh, organize a, a field trip to go uh, up there to check it out uh, later on in this, uh, this uh, course. And uh, we also have a smaller station here in the Packard building uh, up in room 302. So we have some antennas on the roof and a radio. And uh, also, if you're not able to make it up to the, uh, the shack or if it's too long of a hike, we also have uh, some radios that you can log into through the internet remotely. And uh, uh, John Ford there is probably the person to ask about that. Uh, uh, or, or, Pete, uh, or, or Pete, Pete Mahalwald. Pete Mahalwald, the, yeah, back there. <coughs> so, uh, and, and also another great thing that we have in our club is, as I mentioned before, a lot of people with a lot of experience who are uh, interested in uh, mentoring uh, students and people who are new, either uh, people who are experienced students themselves or uh, alumni and community members who have a lot of experience in radio. And, uh, and so that's, uh, and we have a lot of people here today who are actually volunteered to come in and help uh, guide people if you're new uh, to build your kit. So that's uh, a very important thing that we do here in the club, which uh, brings me to uh, today's activity, which is the uh, QDX radio kit. So part of the goal of this activity is actually to get people who are new to radio or new to electronics um, and involved in a project, which can allow them to uh, learn about those things, learn to solder, learn about how radios work. And also it's, it's uh, a pretty interesting kit even for people who have a lot of experience too. Like I, I've had a lot of electronics experience, but I still had a lot of fun building this kit and uh, using it as well. So it's a great way to you know, bring together interest of uh, both uh, ends of the spectrum. And uh, this uh, kit here operates from uh, 3 megahertz up to 30 megahertz, so it operates within that range of frequencies. Which, uh, does anybody remember what that frequency range is called? What was the name of that, that range? It's, so it's, it's there. <laughs> okay, yeah, it says so, so HF. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so that's called the HF uh, span of uh, frequencies. And, the, uh, and this radio operates by what's called frequency shift keying only, or FSK. So it uh, outputs a single frequency at a time, and it can change that frequency. And it's able to encode uh, digital uh, data based on that frequency. So uh, one common mode of transmission is uh, called FT8, and that uses eight different uh, frequencies. And so that, that corresponds to three bits of information based on which of those eight frequencies you choose to transmit. And then it changes that frequency periodically to send another three bits. And, uh, and it's all controlled by a computer through a USB port. And it outputs uh, five watts of RF power, which actually is a very small level of power. If you have your amateur radio license on most of the bands, you're authorized to transmit up to uh, 1,500 watts of power. So. Uh, uh, that's not on all the bands. There's some restrictions based on certain frequencies, but most of the time it's 1,500 watts. So this is actually a very small amount of power compared to what you're allowed to transmit. And actually, it's similar to the power level your cell phone might use or a uh, handheld radio like this. This also transmits 5 watts of power. Um, this radio is able to, um, to operate over a distance of about maybe 5 miles uh, if you're just operating from one radio directly to another radio. Uh, using that five watts of power, and this one is a UHF VHF radio. So, uh, does anyone remember what what is the span of frequencies for UHF and VHF? Thirty to one gigahertz or three megahertz. Uh, yeah. So both. Yeah. So it's between uh, thirty megahertz and three gigahertz. So, it, so the uh, yeah. So VHF was uh, thirty to three hundred megahertz, and then uh, UHF was three hundred to three gigahertz. So th this one operates um, at uh, around like 144 megahertz on one band, and it could also do about uh, like a 440 megahertz is the other band. So, uh, so this has a range by itself of about five miles. The uh, QDX, on the other hand, and th this is what it looks like when you complete it. You see it's a very similar size, uh, similar power level, uh, but this one can uh, transmit signals that travel for thousands of miles and in some cases go all the way around the world. So uh, does anyone know what, what is the difference between these? Why is it that this one has such a short range and this one has such a large range even though they're the same power level? Yes? Uh, do lower frequencies travel further? They, they do travel further. So does anyone know why why the lower frequencies travel further? Yes? The lower frequency is longer wavelength? Yeah, so it's a, a longer wavelength. That's, that's getting there. Yeah. <laughs> 
that they interact differently with the ionosphere? The ionosphere, yes. So, uh, so this difference in the behavior all actually has to do with the ionosphere. So, uh, so this is a, a picture showing sort of a, a rough uh, diagram of what this looks like. So if you have a radio transmitter on the surface of the Earth down here, you'll send out these radio waves, which are drawn as uh, rays coming out of the transmitter in this diagram. And when they get up to a certain height uh, in the upper atmosphere, that uh, there's actually free electrical charges up there. And this, this side here, this diagram shows you uh, the electron uh, density. So these are free electrons that are able to move around, and they're, uh, they've uh, come from ionized atoms. And these are liberated by uh, radiation coming from the sun. So there's uh, ultraviolet and x-rays coming from the sun, which impact these atoms and molecules in the upper atmosphere. And they liberate the electrons from them and ionize those atoms. And that uh, allows you to have these free electrons and free uh, ions that can move around. So the, uh, so the radio waves, uh, so has everybody heard the term electromagnetic wave? So has anyone not heard that term before? OK, so everyone has heard that. So what that means is radio waves, they consist of electric and magnetic fields. So these electric fields, when they get up into the upper ionosphere, they actually push the electrons, and they cause the electrons to move in the direction of the electric field. And that motion of the electron is an electric current, which itself re-radiates uh, radio waves. And what it does is it reflects them back down. And so it acts like a giant mirror up in the upper atmosphere that reflects all the, uh, the waves back down to the surface of the Earth. And um, so, uh, so now everybody, you, you've heard that uh, light is an electromagnetic wave too, right? So, uh, so if the ionosphere reflects electromagnetic waves, then uh, why are we able to see the sun and the stars? Why doesn't it reflect that light? That's a tricky question. Yes? It vibrates, uh, the visible light vibrates faster than the um, resonant like, frequency of the ionosphere would be able to actually like, reflect it. Or it, it, it's transparent because it vibrates faster than like it. Yeah, so it has to do with the, uh, the frequency. So, uh, so if you delve into the physics of this, it turns out when you, when you displace these electrons, they're pulled back to their original location by the positive ions. And that the amount of pull depends on the, uh, the density of the electrons. And the electrons, they have a very small amount of mass. They're very light particles, but they still have some mass. And so that, that pull back by the uh, ions and also the mass of the electrons acts sort of like a, a spring, like a mass on a spring. And it'll cause the electrons to have a natural frequency of oscillation, uh, which is called the plasma frequency or uh, critical frequency. So, it, um, so if you're below that frequency, then the electrons are able to respond to this wave. And if you're, uh, once you're above that frequency, though, the, um, uh, the electrons really aren't able to move very much because the, the electric field is changing direction so quickly. And they, uh, they just stay almost uh, in place and, uh, and don't really contribute to any uh, reflection. And the waves travel straight through the uh, ionosphere. So that's why uh, above a certain critical frequency, the atmosphere becomes transparent. And below that, it's reflected. And uh, when you're right at the boundary of uh, this critical frequency, then you will get an effect which depends on uh, well, a few different factors. So I mentioned the electron density. So, so this diagram here shows two different curves. So this, this is the electron density here, and this is the height above Earth's surface. So you see there's a peak electron density up here. Uh, this is called the F2 layer. Uh, we can talk more about these different layers later, but it just has to do with different regions in which the uh, solar radiation is absorbed. And uh, so you get this uh, peak up here. And then there's another, another peak down here. And this one's labeled uh, daytime. So that's when the, uh, when the solar radiation is able to impact the uh, atmosphere. Uh, this one here says uh, nighttime. So you see there's a different curve with a lower electron density. So, uh, so I told you this, this ionization is created by ultraviolet and x-rays. <coughs> so why is there still ionization at night? Yes? Is it just muons? Or I mean cosmogenics, uh, like particles interacting with the that, upper atmosphere? And that, that's a good, uh, uh, a, a good explanation. Uh, so that, that does contribute somewhat to it. Um, so, uh, 
But I think that that by itself is not enough to fully give the ionizations. There is something additional that, that creates this or, or causes this ionization to be there. Yes? I wonder, does it have anything to do with Earth's magnetic field or like the Van Allen belts or something like that? Uh, I can't think of anything. Else. So, yeah, the, uh, there, is some, there are some complicated effects like that. I think those mainly happen near the poles. Um, but uh, this, this, would have, th this diagram, I think, is at lower latitudes, like closer to the equator. So well, let me give a hint. So if you have these, um, these ions in the upper atmosphere, so you have a positive ion and a free electron, and they're, they're flying around, and uh, occasionally the electron will find that positive ion and recombine. And then some uh, an elect electromagnetic uh, wave, like a uh, X-ray or a ultraviolet photon, will then hit that molecule again and reionize it. And this process is uh, continually happening. So, um, so in these upper regions here, the atmosphere is very sparse versus these lower regions where the uh, pressure is higher and the atmosphere is denser. So how long do you think it takes for the electron and uh, ion to uh, recollide at the lower altitude versus the upper altitude? Much sooner at the lower altitude? Yeah, so it's much sooner. So they're, they're able, because it's so much denser, they're able to find each other much more uh, quickly because they're uh, com compacted together so much more down here versus up here. And so, uh, in order for this ionization to go away, they have to find each other and recombine. Uh, but because they're so sparse up here, it actually takes a while. So this will actually persist throughout the course of the night. They don't fully uh, uh, recombine over the course of the, uh, the nighttime. Uh, and of course, it depends on the season, too, because during the winter, you have a longer night, so they'll have more time to recombine. Um, but uh, the, uh, these lower altitudes, the ionization drops much more uh, rapidly down. And so, uh, so that has a variety of effects uh, on the behavior of the ionosphere. So one is that because this electron density keeps changing, that critical frequency will change over the course of the uh, day as well. And that will change the, uh, uh, what frequencies are able to be reflected. So the, uh, so the ion density or the electron density is one of the things that determines uh, which, which frequencies get reflected and which pass through. Uh, the other is the, uh, the frequency and then there's a third thing. Does anyone know what this uh, third factor is that determines whether a wave will get reflected or pass through? This, this one's a little bit tricky. Yeah? Is it the angle? Yes, the, the angle. Very good. So, uh, so this diagram here shows what happens if you have a wave that's right on the, the boundary of being either uh, passed uh, through or uh, reflected. So the, uh, in this case, you have a... Uh, a wave with a frequency that is able to pass through the ionosphere if it travels straight up. Um, but if you uh, decrease the angle, so it impacts the ionosphere at a shallower and shallower angle, eventually it will get uh, reflected. And, uh, and this is a, a, an effect that's actually, uh, a, it shows up in many different uh, phenomena where you have waves reflecting at boundaries. Another case where you can see this is in uh, water in a swimming pool. So this is a, a photograph taken with an underwater camera looking up underneath the swimming pool. And you can see for the uh, light waves that are going straight up towards the surface, you can see the uh, ceiling of the building over the uh, surface of the water. And then when you get to a shallow enough angle, the waves actually reflect off of the surface of the water and you see a reflection of the uh, floor of the pool. So, uh, so this is pretty much exactly the same effect that happens with radio waves in the ionosphere. Uh, when you're right at this uh, threshold of uh, where the waves are either transmitted or reflected, you'll have this uh, cone of uh, radiation that can travel up into space, and then beyond that, the waves will be uh, reflected back down. So this uh, reflection from the ionosphere, as you can see from this diagram, actually lets you uh, transmit to uh, uh, locations that are much further than you can see by direct line of sight. And uh, so if you had a uh, radio receiver right here, you could actually receive the radiation coming from this transmitter, even if the curvature of the Earth were to block the direct line of sight path. And uh, so these uh, waves here, they'll either be received by your receiver or uh, they could be absorbed by the ground or what else can happen at this point? Reflected. Yeah, they could be reflected and, uh, and go back up to the ionosphere again. 
and the process can repeat. So you can get multiple hops of radio waves bouncing between the surface of the Earth and the ionosphere. Now, the, the surface of the Earth, it's not a very good uh, reflectance, um, and it also depends on a variety of things, like uh, how much water there is in the soil, or even if this is uh, water instead of uh, land. If it's salt water, that's a much better conductor, so that reflects uh, radio waves much better. If this is uh, a rock, dry, rocky area, then a lot of that will get absorbed. But there will still be something that gets reflected, and will go back up to the ionosphere and come back down. And this process can repeat many, many times. So if you have enough radio power to overcome the loss over each of these hops, actually you can, uh, I've heard people have even sent signals going all the way around the world and coming back. So it's, uh, it, it takes a lot of power in order to do that, but you can actually uh, achieve that. So, uh, uh, and also another important point here, you see that says uh, skip distance in this diagram. So this is if, if you have uh, radio waves that, um, that are passed through the ionosphere, if you send them straight up, then uh, in order to get somewhere in this intermediate distance, they would need to reflect at too steep of an angle. And, uh, and if the uh, critical frequency is too low, then they won't be reflected. So this area here will actually uh, not be able to hear you. But if you go further, people will be able to hear you. It's a very, uh, very strange effect. People didn't really understand it when they first started transmitting radio waves at these frequencies, and they eventually figured out it was because of this effect in the ionosphere. So uh, any questions about that? So uh, let me show some uh, pictures of how this actually works. So these were uh, some measurements I made with uh, a radio using the 20-meter uh, band. So that's roughly a 20-meter wavelength. And I uh, was transmitting waves from uh, here in California. And, uh, and this was uh, just uh, recently. And so all of these uh, little um, markers you see on the map, those are stations that are listening to uh, these digital transmissions, and they have uh, a computer that decodes them, and the computer is connected to the internet. And in the software, you can uh, check a checkbox that says to upload whatever you, you hear to the internet, and this website just uh, takes all that data and plots it. So these are all the people all over the world who are listening at that frequency at that time. And uh, the ones with the little uh, timestamps here, that shows uh, that they actually received my signal, and that was the time uh, in the past, so 22 minutes ago, uh, at the time when I took this screenshot. That was when they heard me uh, sending that signal. So all these little uh, timestamps here, those are all stations that were able to hear my signal. So you can see it's a pretty, uh, pretty big area, and that was just uh, using about, uh, about five watts of power that I was transmitting. So all of those uh, signals were hearing my, my uh, or all those stations hearing my signal reflected off the ionosphere and coming back down. And uh, the ones over here, uh, they weren't able to hear me because my signal was probably just too weak by the time it got to that point. So, um, so I tried uh, doing the same thing, but changing the uh, frequency. So I doubled the frequency. So instead of using a 20 meter wavelength, I used a, a 10 meter wavelength. And then uh, these are all the stations that were able to hear me. So you could see, actually I got much further. So all the way uh, station in New Zealand was able to pick up my signal. And uh, Hawaii, Alaska, uh, I think that's uh, Venezuela. And uh, so this was, uh, so this was all using that the- That is Aruba. Aruba, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so this was using a, uh, a higher frequency. And uh, now notice uh, there's this big hole right here where nobody was able to hear me. So that's that effect I was telling you about that skip zone. So that means that the, the 10 meter waves that went straight up through the ionosphere, they just passed through without getting reflected. But at a shallow enough angle, they were able to reflect off the ionosphere and come back down. And right at this threshold, that's where people were able to start hearing me. So that's like that, that boundary you saw in the uh, picture of the swimming pool where you transition from transmission to reflection. And uh, yeah, so the, uh, uh, so now, if the 10 meter waves are able to be reflected, then the 20 meter waves, because they're uh, lower frequency, those should have also been reflected. So how come people didn't hear me in all these locations with the 20 meter waves? Uh, any uh, any thoughts? What? Yes. So yeah, so it was because of that signal being degraded, but the uh, uh, but the the 10 meter uh, signal 
to reach this station here would have had to travel the same path. So if, there, if the wave it has to reflect uh, at the same point in the ionosphere based on the geometry and come back down, so what, why would it, uh, why would the, the 10 meter uh, wave make it to that place, but the 20 meter would not? Yes? Uh, you, def you diffract through objects that are roughly the same uh, length scale as you, so 10 meters would only diffract something on like roughly that scale. I imagine like for two meters, you're diffracting a whole bunch of things that are like two meters long. Like uh, 20 meters. Oh, 20 so meters. The, yeah, sorry. the other one, yeah, so I'll, I'll switch back and forth. So here's 20 meter and 10 meter. Th this was, these were within like 30 minutes of each other. I made these measurements. So you can see the 20 meter, uh, I get all these lo more local stations, and then on 10 meter, I get much further away, and then there's this hole. Yes? Uh, because the geometry, the, the path, uh, propagation path is different between these two. And, and so in what way is it different? Um, well, you know, the indi index indices of refraction of those wavelengths kind of, I don't know, I feel like it has something to do with the material properties of the ionosphere. Okay, yeah, so it does have to do with the ionosphere. And, and I think, um, I think Part of what you're saying con does contribute to this effect. There is some difference in geometry. Um, so, uh, yes? Um, so, uh, so the, uh, at the higher frequencies, you, it'll uh, pass th through the ionosphere if, you, if the angle is too steep. But uh, at a shallower angle, uh, if the uh, 10 meter wave is reflected, the 20 meter wave will also be reflected because you're, you're even lower than that critical frequency than you were before. So I'll, I'll give you another hint. So remember, it has to do with something I was talking about before about the different uh, altitudes. So, uh, so remember we were talking about the um, collisions of the ions at different altitudes, right? So does anyone have an, an idea of how that would affect the waves? Yes? So if the 10 meter penetrates farther into the ionosphere, it'll have to go over like a bigger triangle to reflect down? Uh, so actually, yes. So that, that's one effect. So let me go back to the first diagram here. So this, so remember this uh, ion density chart. So this is showing, um, you, you can think of this as showing how reflective the ionosphere is at different elevations. So uh, so the uh, 10 meter um, might need a, a higher, uh, it'll, it'll need a higher ion density in order to be reflected than 20 meter. So actually it will travel further up into the ionosphere before it gets reflected back down because it needs this higher ion density in order to be uh, reflected. The 20 meter doesn't have to go as high. So actually that triangle of this uh, reflection, if you bring this down, then it'll, uh, it'll be a smaller triangle. So the base of the triangle will be smaller. So That'll, that'll be one effect that reduces the range. Uh, the other effect um, has to do with these uh, collisions between the molecules at these lower elevations. So, the, uh, so even if the 20 meter uh, wave makes it through this region here, uh, it'll still be shaking those electrons in the, these lower regions of the ionosphere, even though the wave is passing through that region. And uh, if they're not contributing to the reflection of the wave, then um, the only other thing, uh, well, what's the only other thing that they can do if they're not, uh, if they're not reflecting? Absorption. Yeah, so, so the wave is either transmitted, reflected, or absorbed. So uh, part of it will be transmitted, but there's going to be some that's absorbed, and the absorption has to do with the uh, collisions of the electrons losing their energy. So they absorb energy from the radio wave, and then they collide into some of the molecules and lose that energy. And that will uh, cause your uh, energy to go into heating the ionosphere, and it will reduce the signal that gets transmitted. So the, uh, the 10 meter wave works better because it has a higher frequency, so it reverses direction more quickly. And, uh, and so that uh, frequency compared to the frequency of the collisions of the mo molecules is what determines how much of the signal gets lost and how much gets transmitted. So it, in the extreme case, if you're to have a, a wave that had an extremely uh, low frequency, then all the electrons would start moving in the direction of the wave, but they would collide with a bunch of molecules before it even has the time to uh, reverse. So they would just, uh, it would have a uh, effect of just behaving almost like a resistor. So, uh, 
So that, that effect is another thing that determines um, how far you're able to transmit is the, the absorption caused by these lower regions of the ionosphere. But luckily, those tend to uh, be the ones that diminish most quickly at night. So at night, you can actually get a lot of times much uh, further communication because this absorption in the lower ionosphere goes away. So, uh, so I also did some uh, measurements of uh, day versus night. So, uh, so here's an example of another uh, day. And, uh, and in this particular day, I was able to get much further on the 20 meter band. Uh, so people have heard me in Hawaii, uh, Mexico, Alaska. And, uh, and then I did the uh, same uh, measurements, but at nighttime. And now you can see uh, at night, I got much further. So people heard me in Japan and Australia, New Zealand, and uh, I think that might be Puerto Rico and the Azores Islands. Yeah, and then also notice that there's now this hole uh, where people didn't hear me, but this is on the 20-meter uh, band, not the 10-meter band. And that's because the ion density went down at night. So now the 20-meter, if you were to send it straight up, passes through the ionosphere. And uh, if you wanted to talk to people in this uh, region here, you'd need to go down to even uh, lower frequencies. So uh, any questions about that? So, uh, yes, yeah, so you need to know about... Oh, yes. Were these taken 100 times a year? Uh, oh, yeah, th this one was in October. Yeah. But the, other, the original one, was that more towards the solstice? Uh, right. right. Yeah, this, that, that one, the other one was uh, just uh, like uh, this past week. This one was October of last year. So, uh, yeah, so th these things, uh, y you will see different uh, behavior depending on, uh, well, day versus night, we already discussed, but also. Uh, you will see seasonal fluctuations because during the seasons, the sun is at different angles above the horizon, which determines how much ultraviolet and X-ray radiation reaches a certain patch of the ionosphere. So you will see uh, this change over the course of the year as well. And, uh, and then there's also a, uh, a variation that you'll see over 11 years. So does anyone know what, what would cause an 11-year variation? Yes? The solar cycle? Uh, the solar cycle, yes. So... Uh, so it turns out that this ultraviolet and X-ray radiation from the sun, a lot of it comes from these active regions around uh, sunspots. And, so, and the sunspots uh, come and go in an 11-year cycle. And this has been measured for hundreds of years since, I think, 1750s or so. So we're now in what's called cycle 25. So that's the 25th uh, cycle that's been measured since people first started uh, keeping uh, count of sunspots. And, uh, and you can see this. Uh, Today, we're here. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. I, yeah, because I, I just I, I, uh, downloaded this, I think, like on Monday or something. Yeah, so those, those uh, are monthly averages that you're uh -huh. seeing there, but the other, today we're at like 185 or something like that. Oh, wow. Nice. So, uh, yeah, so when you get into these, uh, near the peak of the sunspot cycle, you have very intense ultraviolet and x-rays impacting the upper uh, uh, ionosphere. And so that makes a very high electron density, so it becomes very reflective to a lot of different wavelengths. And you can actually go to higher and higher frequencies and have them uh, reflected. And then when you're down near the, the bottom of the uh, sunspot cycle, then the sun is very quiet. There's much lower ultraviolet and x-rays. And uh, the ionosphere is uh, not, not as ionized. And so you need to go to lower frequencies in order for them to be reflected. Uh, the higher frequencies will just pass right through. So, uh, so this is actually a good time to be uh, building this radio because we are climbing up towards the uh, peak right now. And we'll be a uh, high uh, sunspot number at least for the next few years or so. So you'll get very good uh, performance out of your radio. And then, uh, so this will is predicted to come back down again maybe around like 20, 30 or so. The sunspot numbers will start declining and go, going to the solar minimum. So the, uh, so the QDX radio um, is able to operate in uh, the HF uh, bands, as I mentioned before. Uh, there is a uh, caveat, though. So the, the kits that we have, uh, by default, come with uh, certain parts that are tuned to use only certain uh, ones of these bands. So they come with, uh, with these filter components that allow you to cover uh, everything from the 80-meter amateur radio band up to 20 meters. And uh, by default, it doesn't, it's not able to operate at frequencies higher than that. Uh, but there is a, uh, oh yes, a uh, question? Uh, 
I'm not sure. I, I have not heard of that effect before, about uh, effects from the moon. Uh, so, uh, imagine that some of the radiation might bounce, like the sunlight would bounce off and come back to Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I haven't heard of that before. It, it's possible there may be some small effect, but uh, I, I haven't heard of that. But, yeah, good, good question, though. So, uh, yeah, so, so there is a, a second option. So if you change some of the component values in the uh, QDX kit, you can actually get it to operate over uh, this range of frequencies instead. So this would cover the uh, 20 meter band to the 10 meter band. So, um, so like I mentioned, that is that, that actually might be better suited to the uh, near the peak of the solar cycle. Uh, you definitely need the lower ones if you want to operate near the minimum of the solar cycle. Although I, I was trying it uh, a couple nights ago, and uh, 20 meters was not really working well at night. I had to go down to 40 meters. Um, so th these things will vary. I mean, it's a lot like the weather, uh, where you have some you know, seasonal averages, but then there's fluctuations above that. And there's a lot of other things that happen, like solar flares and, and, and things like that, that can affect the propagation of these radio waves. So th this isn't a... Uh, you know, it's not that easy to predict, but these are sort of the average behaviors that you can expect. So the, uh, the other nice thing about uh, it, this uh, second option of the kit using the, that gives you uh, these higher frequencies is that it includes the 10 meter band, which I mentioned before, there's a small section of the 10 meter band here that you're allowed to use just with the technician uh, amateur radio license, which is the first level. So that's the easiest license to get. And, uh, and it includes the band where people use these digital uh, communications modes that the QDX can operate on. So, uh, so if you uh, were only interested in getting the technician license, you, you should definitely make the kit so it'll operate on the 10 meter band. Uh, but I do recommend getting the general license that gives you all these other bands that you can use because it is a lot more convenient to be able to change bands as the ionosphere conditions are changing so you can always make a contact with the 10 meter band, you really need to be close to the peak of the solar cycle and during the daytime in order for that to work. At night, it's, most of the time, it's not going to work that well. It, of course, it'll, it'll vary. And then, of course, when you get down uh, and the sunspot number starts declining, uh, the 10 meter band is not going to be reflective at all. It'll just go off into space. So, uh, uh, but that is a, a choice you can make when you're building the kit. So if you, uh, if you are interested in building it to operate in these higher frequencies, um, there are certain parts in the instructions where you should uh, hold off for now because we're going to, uh, we're, we're actually in the process right now of getting the new components. If you wanted to make it work in this range of frequencies, you'll need to use different components than the ones included in the kit. And, uh, and also, if you have options to use all of these different bands, uh, but these are not all equally popular. So I just did a, a, a screenshot to, or a snapshot to capture how many people were on uh, these different bands using the, the digital mode called FT8. So these are the bands ranging from 160 meters up to the 6 meter band. And, uh, and you can see at that time the most popular band was 10 meters, uh, followed by 20 meters and then 40 meters. So those ones are, you'll find people on there all the time. So if you're looking for someone to talk to, uh, just rand some random person. Uh, you want to go to where most of the people are, or whatever is most popular, because otherwise if you're transmitting on a frequency and nobody's tuned to listen to that frequency, you're not going to make a uh, contact. Uh, so this will, of course, vary as the ionosphere varies. So uh, at night, people will tend to move to these lower frequencies, and so they'll tend to move to 20 or 40 meters or maybe even 80 meters if you're close to the solar minimum. And then... Uh, but th those tend to be the most popular bands, at least what I've seen. There's some other ones. You see 15 meters is maybe the next most popular at that, uh, at that time. Uh, these other ones you, uh, usually have less activity. I don't know, uh, John, is this typical you see, you've seen for? So this will change with conditions. I mean, this, te th this, this was done at uh, 120 in the p.m. in the afternoon local time, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so the 10 meter band with the current sunspots that we have was wide open, and so a lot of people went there <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to, to play, and everyone who goes there and clicks that button on the software that puts you in the mode where you're reporting to this uh, web-based system, you know, is now reporting. So, so this, is a, this is a rough indication of level of overall activity at any given time, but it's going to dynamically shift to the lower frequencies um, when, 
in period of times when the largest population centers in the world are in darkness, mm -hmm. right? Because that's where the most operators are. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so the reason why it's good to know which bands are most popular is because uh, you're, once you build your kit, you'll need an antenna. And so, uh, so there's a variety of different antenna options. And uh, so the one that we're going to make first is called the dipole antenna. And uh, this diagram shows uh, roughly how that works. So the, uh, the dipole antenna just consists of two lengths of wire uh, that you attach to your radio. So your radio, radio goes here in the middle. And you notice that it says uh, lambda over 2, so that's wavelength over 2, which means that the, the total length of wire is half a wavelength. And uh, the reason for that is because when you cut your wire to that length, there are waves that can travel back and forth on this wire. And uh, cutting it to that length makes it resonant with a uh, standing wave uh, that's half of a wavelength long. And so if you were to cut it to a different length, it would shift the frequency of resonance of that antenna. So you want to make sure that your, the length of wire is cut to, uh, to half a wavelength of the band that you want to use. So that's why you need to know ahead of time what band you want to use so that you cut your wire to the right length. And it's good to cut it to the length that's going to match whatever the most popular band is at, at uh, you know, the time or what you want to, to be able to use. Uh, there are some other options, like there's this N-fed half-wave antenna where you can use a uh, length of wire and you can resonate it at multiple multiples of a certain frequency. So like this, this diagram here shows um, starting at the 80 meter band where you have a half wave and you go to 40, 30. So each uh, step you go up, you, uh, you reach a different uh, harmonic multiple of that fundamental frequency and you get a different number of half waves uh, resonance on this wire. And so uh, you can use a single piece of wire cut to a single length and operate on multiple bands that are all uh, harmonic multiples of each other. So, uh, so if you're to make something like this, then actually you don't necessarily need to uh, choose ahead of time what band you want to use. You can have access to all of them. Uh, so there's a nice uh, kit that I just recently built that, um, that can do this, and you can tune uh, to some of these different uh, frequencies and use the same wire for all of them. Uh, but uh, it is more uh, complex than just the simple uh, dipole. And uh, if, if people are interested, we could do another uh, bulk order for that. So come and talk to me later. I, I have one of these with you so I can show you what it looks like. And uh, now all, all of these, because uh, they're half wave long, that's, uh, that's actually pretty big. So uh, it's actually, why don't I show you right now what, what a half wave looks like. So, uh, so this, this wire here, I cut to be a, a half wave for the uh, 20 meter band. So. Uh, so here, would someone mind uh, grabbing one end of this wire? Okay, and then just uh, yeah, we'll walk out that way. So this, uh, okay, so, so this is uh, your half-wave antenna at 20 meters. Which so, is, which is 10 meters, half of 20 yeah. meters, which is very, roughly 33 feet. Right? So, so this is, uh, so if you wanted to do an end-fed half-wave, you would have your box at that end over there. And then this end would go somewhere like up in a tree or uh, tied to the top of a building or something like that. But you see it's a, a pretty big antenna. Uh, on the 10 meter band would be half that length. On the 40 meter band would have to be double. So, um, so this is something that's, uh, you know, this would be hard to fit inside of a room. So if you want to make something in your dorm room, this is not going to work. Uh, there are other options you could do, like you can fold it back on itself a bit. That's going to reduce the amount of radiation, but it, uh, it still might be able to work well enough to get a signal out and make a contact. So, uh, so that is, uh, so that's the limitation if you want to use a wire antenna. There are other options if you want a more compact antenna. Uh, so one option is called a magnetic loop antenna. So you can make a uh, much smaller loop. And it doesn't have to be a half wave or anything like that. And you use uh, capacitors to tune the frequency instead of uh, using the length of the wire. And you can make that much more compact uh, and uh, even portable. The uh, drawback is because it's much smaller, it doesn't radiate as efficiently. So thank you. So there's more loss. So your signal at a distance is going to be weaker. And, but and it's uh, more work to build. Yeah, uh, that, that's true. So depending on the design, it, it's gonna, you're going to have to put more work into it than just cutting wire to a certain length. So th there's uh, antenna design is always a trade-off between multiple options of uh, what performance you want to get and what uh, portability you want and things like that. 
So any questions about any of that? Okay, so I think we're ready to uh, talk about the QDX kit build. So, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, start out by choosing whether you want to do the default uh, 80 meter to 20 meter range of, uh, of bands, which just uses the parts that are included in the kit, or if you want to do the 20 to 10 meter option. If you want to do that, then whenever you get to a step in the kit assembly manual that, that uh, usually it's highlighted and in red, and it has either this range of uh, bands or that range. If you see something like that, then don't do that yet, because uh, we need to uh, gather together the parts for the 20 meter to 10 meter option. Um, and we'll come back to that next week. We'll probably have the parts ready then. And uh, also in the manu manual, you'll see, uh, it'll say you have a choice between 9 volt or 12 volt uh, options. So we got 12 volt power supplies, so do the 12 volt option. And, uh, and also, uh, if you, uh, we, we'd like to divide everybody up into uh, partners. So all these workbenches have two chairs, uh, roughly per soldering iron. So uh, uh, ideally what we'd like to do, because we have people with a wide range of uh, experience levels here, if you're, if you're very new to electronics or soldering, then uh, find somebody who's experienced and pair up with that person so that, uh, so that you won't be lost or confused if, if you have two people who are inexperienced together. So, Try to find somebody that, uh, when, once we uh, complete this and start collecting the kits, we can, uh, uh, I'll ask people to, to indicate if they have some experience, so you can pair up that way. Um, and, uh, and also, yeah, so check, uh, also when you're putting the kit together, make sure you double check the components before you solder them, because it's much harder to remove them once they're soldered in. And, uh, and there's also another step in here. Uh, where you wind these uh, coils using some uh, wire that's called enameled wire. So it, it's uh, copper wire that has sort of a, uh, looks like a painted coating on it. And uh, the, uh, that coating will actually melt when you hold the soldering iron on it. And, uh, and then the solder will stick to the metal underneath. Uh, but if you're not careful, you might not heat it up enough and the, the insulation might not melt and you might not get a good connection. So uh, if you're, especially if you're new to soldering, make sure you, you ask for help when doing that and we'll, we'll double check, have somebody double check to make sure it actually did melt and you have a good connection. Are those mostly on the uh, Torex? Yeah. The mm -hmm. yeah. So the enamel is important because it's an insulator and you're wrapping around it and so it keeps the, the, the turns of the wire from shorting. So you don't, you don't want to scratch the enamel, mm -hmm. right, because it's keeping, it's, an, it's the insulator you're relying on. But when you take the ends of the wires and need to connect them to the board, or the board you have you got to make sure that you got a good connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, so then uh, that's what we're going to do. So uh, we are going. So all the QDX kits are over here in the boxes. So uh, once we finish this, we're going to all line up. And because uh, I have a checklist, I want to make sure everybody gets their their kits and that they're all accounted for. And we'll check, hand them out, and check them off one by one. And then, uh, and also, yeah, if, and we'll check you into the, uh, the attendance sheet if you haven't uh, checked in yet. And we'll divide up into groups of two and uh, make sure at least one person has soldering experience. And then uh, at, once you get back to your workspace, make sure you have a soldering iron, solder. Uh, there's some solder and safety glasses up there. So grab solder, safety glasses, make sure you have a circuit board holder, and uh, make sure you have the QDX manual either on your phone or printed out. And uh, just a uh, final review of safety. So you all should have completed the, uh, the safety, um, lab safety, but uh, probably the two biggest things to be aware of are burn hazards and eye hazards. So the, if you're gonna be soldering, the soldering iron gets very hot and you can burn yourself on that if you tu accidentally touch it to your fingers. And uh, so be aware of that. Also the, the solder, when it's melted, blobs can fall off and, and fall on your hand or fingers. So be careful of that. And if, in case you do get burned or some solder hits you or you touch the soldering iron, there's a, a sink over there. Just uh, run the, uh, your skin under the cold water just to cool it off. And, uh, and then for eye hazards, so make sure that you're wearing uh, safety glasses if you're doing the soldering. Uh, uh, solder blobs do occasionally fly through the air if you accidentally flick something, a little blob can go flying. And I have had safety glasses on and accidentally flicked solder and it has hit my safety glasses before. So. I have been glad to have those on. And uh, the other thing that can cause things to fly through the air is if you're using wire cutters and you're, you're cutting something, sometimes the wire can be a little springy and it can go flying off uh, through the air. So um, 
So make sure if you're doing that, the people nearby are aware that there's a eye hazard and that they're not uh, you know, right next to it without realizing that you're just about to cut something. Uh, another thing that I do sometimes if I'm cutting something with wire cutters is to hold my hand over it so the, the little bit of uh, the end of the wire will just hit, hit my palm and not fly anywhere and uh, it won't go into anybody's eye. All probability that that can happen, but just uh, it, it's good to take precautions just to make sure. So uh, any questions? No? Okay, so let's, uh, let's line up uh, over, starting over here and you know, form a line that way and we'll uh, hand out the kits and get started.